By 1942, the war was no longer another great European conflict. It was now firmly a global affair, enveloping all of the world's great powers as the Allies squared off against the tyranny and aggression of the Axis nations. Against such colossal forces, no one country could stand alone, and events that affected one combatant would ultimately have consequences for the other further down the road. To that end, while the Western Allies and the Soviet Union were effectively fighting separate wars against the same enemy, there needed to be cooperation between the two fronts in order to squeeze the life out of Nazi Germany and ensure victory against fascism. However, the relationship was often a strained one, as both allied power blocs were suspicious of the other's intentions once the war was over. Thus, we come to the subject of today's episode, and a story of the war that is still the subject of much debate today. It was an operation that had no specific military objective other than to be an experiment in conducting division-sized amphibious landings against a fortified beach, and as a gesture to the Soviet Union, who were starting to feel abandoned by their allies. It is an operation that has become seared into the hearts and minds of the Canadian people for all the sacrifice they were asked to make it. This is the story of Operation Jubilee, the Dieppe Raid. Every morning, I listen to a blink as I'm getting ready for work. It is the perfect way to start the day, and I feel like I'm learning important information from books that I do not have time to read. Blinkist is an amazing app that lets you either read or listen to the most important bits from over 5,500 non-fiction books and podcasts in about 15 minutes. It's bite-sized information which fits perfectly into your day, and I've been enjoying a series of blinks about brain hacking and neurology, including one about dueling neurosurgeons and the history of neuroscience and where it's going next. After this, I'm going to dive into a collection on game theory, something that I've always been interested in, but have never had the time to read five books on it. It includes finite and infinite games. Look it up now and let me know what you think. Even better is the new feature that Blinkist has, shared spaces. I've been listening to some interesting Blinks, and I've been able to share my favorite titles with friends and family, and they don't have to have a Blinkist premium subscription to be able to listen. Blinkist are offering a 7-day free trial and 25% off a Blinkist annual premium subscription just by using the link in the description. Again, just click the link in the description for a 7-day free trial and 25% off a Blinkist annual premium subscription. Welcome to Wars of the World. The arrival of 1942 heralded the start of probably the darkest time for the Allies engaged in the fight against fascism, and which now included the United States and the Soviet Union, after both nations were caught in surprise attacks by the Axis nations of Japan and Germany, respectively. On the Eastern Front, German forces, along with their anti-Soviet allies, had weathered their first bitter winter and resumed their offensive eastward, pushing the Red Army back and charging into the oil-rich Caucasus region. In North Africa, Rommel was still grinding his way through British and Commonwealth forces into Egypt, while Britain itself, although having been spared invasion by winning the Battle of Britain, was suffering under an increasingly effective U-boat blockade. In the new arenas of the Pacific and Asia, Japan seemed equally unstoppable as its forces carried out its own blitzkrieg, taking more and more land with each passing day, while at sea they were edging ever closer to the US west coast. Against this backdrop of disasters, relations between the big three Allied leaders, Britain's Winston Churchill, America's Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the Soviet Union's Joseph Stalin, also grew increasingly strained. With America now entering the war with its industrial might and immense manpower able to be thrown into the ring, Stalin began demanding his allies' attack occupied Western Europe immediately 
and open up a second front on the continent to relieve pressure on his own forces in the east. There were many American commanders too who felt the same way, believing that an immediate assault on France, followed by a charge into Germany to eradicate the Nazi leadership, would end the fighting everywhere as Nazi Germany collapsed. As the old saying went, chop off the snake's head and the body will die. However, despite initially promising Stalin such an undertaking, Churchill disagreed, as did his American counterpart. He believed such an assault at that time would fail, given Germany's strength, even with millions of its troops in the Soviet Union. Furthermore, the tactics and technology for such a massive amphibious assault on Germany's Atlantic Wall, its string of coastal defenses stretching from Scandinavia to Spain, then under construction, were untested. All of this was, of course, without taking into consideration the resources needed for the war against Japan. In an effort to appease Stalin, he suggested that the Allies should focus on defeating Rommel in 1942, while at the same time conduct an intense bombing campaign of German industry and infrastructure to reduce Nazi Germany's ability to manufacture war materials. An invasion could then be launched in 1943, by which time the situation in the Far East with Japan should have stabilized. But rather than reassure Stalin, Churchill's recommendation only triggered the dictator's notorious paranoia. Stalin knew that before they had been forced into a marriage of convenience to face the Nazi threats, Churchill had been a staunch anti-communist and had been the driving force in Britain to send troops and armaments to help the white Russian cause during the Russian Civil War, as did the United States. Given this knowledge, and armed with estimates of how many of his countrymen would perish before Churchill's planned second front next year, Stalin began to suspect that the delay was deliberate in order to bleed the Soviet Union of as many of its people as possible, fighting the Nazis. Not wanting to lose Stalin's cooperation, Churchill knew he had to do something to convince the Soviet Union that he and Roosevelt were committed to playing an equal part in defeating Nazi Germany in Europe. Weighing up his options, Churchill began to entertain the idea of landing a sizable force at a location in France where they could inflict heavy casualties and cause significant damage over a 24-hour period before withdrawing. Essentially, this was a raid, but one larger than any that had been conducted previously. But not even this was enough to temper Stalin, who made it clear that he felt Churchill and Roosevelt were going back on their word regarding a second front but in the end, there was little he could do about it. As the logistics of the plan began to be worked out, two prominent supporters of the raid emerged. The first, and perhaps the most unexpected, was the Royal Air Force's Fighter Command, the branch of the service tasked with wrestling control of the air from the German Luftwaffe. Having been victorious in the Battle of Britain during the summer of 1940, fighter operations dropped off considerably in 1941, as much of the German bomber fleets were relocated east against the Soviets, and so RAF fighters now had to go looking for their prey over Europe. Unfortunately, the Supermarine Spitfires and Hawker Hurricanes lacked the range necessary for such offensive operations, and with the arrival of the awesome Fokker Wolf FW-190 fighter, which outclassed even the newer Spitfire MK5s, the Germans were able to achieve air superiority over Western France up to the English Channel. A major raid on the French coast, such as that being planned, would draw up large numbers of German fighters, which could then be met by RAF fighters flying fairly close to home. Also, they could better organize themselves effectively, knowing where the Germans would be operating, and use their MK9 Spitfires designed specifically for fighting the FW-190 to hopefully inflict heavy casualties on the Luftwaffe's fighter fleet in France. The other major supporter of the raid, and certainly the most significant, was the Canadian government and the Canadian Army's senior command. Since September 1939, the Royal Canadian Navy had seen extensive combat against the German U-boat fleets, while members of the Royal Canadian Air Force had fought in the Battle of Britain, and were now an integral part of the night bomber offensive against Germany. But aside from participating in the ill-fated defense of Hong Kong, the Canadian Army had seen comparatively little action compared to their British and American allies, the latter of which had only been in the war for a few months in 1942. 
Thousands of Canadians had made the perilous Atlantic crossing to aid Britain's defence, and were now eager to get stuck into the fight and prove their mettle. Therefore, it was agreed that the raid would largely be a Canadian affair, but backed up with support from the US and Britain. However, planning for the operation remained largely in the hands of the British. The combined operations headquarters was the organization of the British War Office set up in 1940, with the express task of coordinating the branches of the British Armed Forces in integrated operations against the coast of occupied Europe. In short, their job was to conduct raids. Formed under the stewardship of Admiral of the Fleet Roger Keyes, on October 27, 1941, command passed to Lord Louis Mountbatten, uncle of the future Queen Elizabeth II's husband, Prince Philip, and who was then a serving officer in the Royal Navy, receiving the rank of Commodore with his new command. Despite the wider misfortunes befalling the Allies in early 1942, Mountbatten's command was on something of a roll, having conducted several increasingly successful raids, culminating in the spectacular destruction of the Saint-Nazaire dock to prevent the German battleship Tirpitz from using it to strike out at Allied convoys. In that instance, Mountbatten's command concocted one of the most audacious plans of the war by essentially turning an old British destroyer into a giant floating bomb guided to the target by a volunteer crew. The raid was awesomely successful, and a major propaganda coup for the Allies, which afforded Mountbatten significant influence with Churchill. However, as Mountbatten and his staff narrowed down potential locations for Churchill's raid, the Prime Minister at times proved more of a hindrance than an ally. Having been caught up in the excitement of the undertaking they were planning, he began making impractical and at times absurd demands regarding the scale of the operation. Eventually, Churchill's excitement was tempered with cold hard facts, as the Target Selection Committee found themselves narrowed down to seven potential targets along the French coast. A key point in the selection of these targets was their proximity to RAF bases in southern England, from where fighters and fighter bombers would be flying in support of the landings. Eventually, these seven were whittled down to one, which seemed to meet all the requirements for a successful raid on the scale being considered, a small coastal town called Dieppe. Dieppe was just 65 miles from New Haven in England, meaning it was comfortably in the range of British fighter aircraft and was relatively lightly defended. However, the flip side was that beside a fairly new radar station built there, there was little of any real strategic value to be found. Therefore, the coming raid was not only unique in its scale, but also that it had no clearly defined objective other than to kill Germans, destroy their equipment and defenses, and collect as much intelligence as possible before withdrawing. However, this denied the wider objectives of the raid in winning the war. The raid would also be an experiment in landing large numbers of troops against a fortified German position, and test the tactics and technology devised for eventually launching a full-scale invasion of occupied Europe. If it was also successful enough to shock the Germans, then they may redeploy some of their forces from the Eastern Front to Europe to guard against further large-scale raids, thus giving Churchill and Roosevelt something tangible with which to temper Stalin's frustrations. On April 4th, 1942, Mountbatten made a small note on the report made by the targeting committee that recommended Dieppe. It simply said, it's on. However, Dieppe was far from an easy target, despite its fairly light defenses, and it was realized that in order to be successful, at least six battalions would be required. For added insurance, very early on, tanks were included in the planning process, the first time armored vehicles would conduct an amphibious assault operation. Initially, the plan was for armored units equipped with the new but untried Churchill tanks to be landed on the flanks of Dieppe and then circle inwards. But this plan was dropped, as it was feared that given the time it would take for the tanks to reach Dieppe, the element of surprise would be lost, and surprise was going to be key to success. Instead, the decision was therefore taken to employ tanks in a direct assault on Dieppe, but with an intense air attack by heavy bombers first to soften up defenses. This new plan would also see British paratroopers land on the flanks instead, their job being to silence the coastal batteries on the east and west side of Dieppe, respectively. Now dubbed Operation Rutter, 
In all, the raiding force would consist of nearly 6,000 troops, over 5,000 of whom were members of the 2nd Canadian Division, under the command of Major General J. Hamilton Roberts. While the Canadians and 1,000 British troops going with them trained for their respective operations, and the tank crews practiced beach landings, a large flotilla of ships began to form up, ready to take them to Dieppe. However, it was here that the key element of rudder, surprise, started to slip away. A Luftwaffe reconnaissance aircraft spotted the flotilla, tipping off the German command that something big was afoot, and numerous German planes would be spotted over the coming days, monitoring the buildup. On June 13, 1942, it was decided to conduct a full dress rehearsal and have the Canadians invade the Dorset coastline at Bridport and West Bay, which were deemed closest to resembling the conditions at Dieppe. Dubbed in a rather distinctly Canadian manner as Exercise Yukon, it didn't go according to plan and revealed several shortcomings in their preparedness. Given this less than ideal performance, Mountbatten felt he couldn't authorize Rutter to take place and postponed the operation, ordering another rehearsal, dubbed Yukon 2, to take place on June 23rd, by which time, hopefully the mistakes of the first exercise would have been learned. Yukon 2 was a vast improvement, the men having trained exceptionally hard in the days between, and while there were still some nagging concerns, Mountbatten felt confident enough to give Rutter the go-ahead. It was only now that the vast majority of officers along the 2nd Canadian Division were told that the training was for a real operation, while the rank and file were only told as they prepared to embark on their troop ships on July 2nd. Confidence among them was high, but already fate was intervening. The weather in the English Channel was proving its usual unpredictable self as a storm swept in, forcing the operation to be delayed until July 7th. However, this presented its own problems in that Dieppe would experience a later second tide that day, giving the Germans at least three additional hours to bring in reinforcements to hit the tanks sitting on the beach, waiting for the water to be deep enough for the tank landing craft to come in and recover them. Mountbatten therefore decided that the raid would be shortened to cover just one tide at Dieppe instead of the original two. Thus, the raiding force would have to do as much damage and retrieve as much intelligence as they could in 12 hours, as opposed to the original 24. Then, in the early hours of July 7th, as the force prepared to get underway on this new, shorter raid, the Luftwaffe appeared in the sky over the flotilla. Four FW-190s, armed with 500 kilogram bombs, attacked the troop ships HMS Princess Astrid and HMS Princess Charlotte as they sat in Yarmouth Roads waiting for the order to go. Both ships suffered heavy damage, and this, coupled with the increasingly unpredictable weather, forced Mountbatten to reluctantly cancel Rutter. The raiding force returned to their barracks in the UK, tired, frustrated, and with many suffering from seasickness, having been cooped up in their troop ships rolling about on the unsettled waters for days. The collapse of Mountbatten's plan before it even properly got started had repercussions beyond simply the cancellation of a single military endeavor. Obviously, Stalin wasn't best pleased that he wasn't even getting this supersized raid he'd been promised in place of the second front he wanted. However, there were also concerns coming from American circles around the capability of their Anglo-Canadian allies to mount any significant operation, leading to some questioning whether it was even in America's best interest to maintain Roosevelt's policy of dealing with Germany as the priority over Japan. Finally, there was the fear that now the Germans had been made aware of a major operation likely against occupied France going awry, it might embolden them to reduce their defensive posture and send more troops eastward. In short, the exact opposite of what Churchill had hoped to achieve. Therefore, it was quickly decided to revive Operation Rutter and reschedule it for as soon as possible, and that time was determined to be mid-August. In the meantime, some aspects of the plan were slightly altered. The use of paratroopers, for example, was dropped, as was the pre-attack bombardment by the RAF, again for fear of inflicting civilian casualties. In the former case, the paratroopers were to be replaced by commandos who would go in by sea like the rest of the raiding force and destroy the coastal batteries flanking Dieppe. 
This was the kind of work the commando force were accustomed to, so there was little concern in that regard, but the lack of a pre-raid bombardment by the RAF was more worrying, especially since the Royal Navy refused to let any of its battleships or battle cruisers with their heavy firepower take part in the operation. The service was still reeling from the destruction of HMS Repulse and HMS Prince of Wales by Japanese aircraft three days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, and did not want to repeat in the English Channel. Instead, the raid would have to rely on RAF fighter bombers providing close support and the rather limited firepower of eight destroyers that would be accompanying them. An additional unit that was to be involved in the raid was some 50 US Army Rangers, their inclusion apparently being at the request of President Roosevelt, who wanted US troops to be seen in action in Western Europe. To distinguish it from the previous attempt, the raid would now be conducted under the umbrella of Operation Jubilee, and on August 18th, 1942, the raiding force was again assembled, and their target made clear, Dieppe. Making their way across the channel, the raiding force and their escorts received more detailed briefings on their targets and how the operation was to proceed. They would be landing on six beaches in total, each of which were assigned colors in order to identify them. On the east and west flanks of Dieppe were Yellow and Orange Beach, where the British No. 3 and 4 commando units would land respectively, taking out the coastal batteries. Included in their number were small forces of free French commandos, while No. 4 commando would also include the 50 US Army Rangers. Sandwiched between Orange Beach and Dieppe itself was Green Beach, which would be assaulted by the Canadian South Saskatchewan Regiment and the Cameron Highlanders of Canada. Their objective was the German defenders at Pourville, who were tasked with guarding the east side of Dieppe. Concurrently, Blue Beach, located between Yellow Beach and Dieppe, would be hit by the Royal Regiment of Canada and the Black Watch of Canada to silence German positions at Puy. The main thrust of the operation against Dieppe would take place at White and Red Beaches and would be conducted by the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry the Essex Scottish, the Fusiliers Mont Royal, the 14th Canadian Army Tank Regiment, and the British Royal Marine A Commando. They were charged with fighting their way off the beach, up over the sea wall, and into Dieppe, driving off German troops and allowing for the destruction of German defences to begin before withdrawal. From the off, there seemed to be more confidence of success this time around, but unknown to Allied troops as they sailed toward their objective, fate was again conspiring against them. Firstly, much of the intelligence being used had been little updated since Rutter, and the Germans, knowing something was afoot, had increased their readiness in France, anticipating a large-scale raid would be taking place, although they anticipated it to happen at one of the many U-boat pens they had constructed. Their biggest tip-off, however, came with German intelligence successfully inserting a double agent into the local resistance, this agent learning of Allied interest in the area around Dieppe, although they failed to appreciate just how important this was. Guarding Dieppe was the Wehrmacht's 302nd Infantry Division, a unit hardly considered elite by either the Germans or Allied intelligence. Given the scale of the events on the Eastern Front, the 302nd's ranks had to be filled with many non-German volunteered from occupied or pro-Axis countries to bring it to full strength. Furthermore, they had to make do with large numbers of captured Belgian, Czech, and French weapons, while their logistics teams still relied largely on horse-drawn carts. However, they were well dug in behind heavy fortifications, and were able to call upon significant reinforcements, including panzers stationed at Amiens, as well as the Luftwaffe fighters and bombers, prompting raids by British and American bombers to be ordered against nearby aerodromes as the raid got underway hoping to destroy as many Luftwaffe planes on the ground as possible before they could interfere. Operating under radio silence, the flotilla, consisting of some 237 vessels of various sizes from troop ships and destroyers to landing craft and gunboats, had a strict timetable to follow in order to ensure cohesion. They successfully navigated a German-laid minefield that the Royal Navy had clandestinely cleared in advance, and at 300 hours, the troops began disembarking to their landing craft some 10 miles from shore, this distance necessary in order to prevent German coastal radar from detecting the large troop ships. 
Back in England, however, British radar operators were themselves tracking a number of objects skirting the French coast towards the flotilla from Boulogne. The objects were a small German coastal convoy sailing under the cover of darkness, escorted by three German Navy submarine chasers, and their destination was, of all places, Dieppe. Thus, the German ships stumbled across the eastward-most section of the flotilla, comprising 23 landing craft, each carrying around 20 men of Number 3 Commando, two escort gunboats, and two destroyers. Almost immediately, the British gunboats and the German submarine chasers began exchanging fire with one another, but the destroyers failed to take any action. In the confusion, and from their position much further out, they had assumed the incoming fire was coming from the shore. One of the German submarine chasers was sunk in the battle, but the damage was done. Several landing craft were sunk or disabled, while the rest of the force scattered to avoid destruction. But worse still, the Wehrmacht at Dieppe now knew for certain the raiders were coming. Just 18 of the commandos landed on time at Yellow Beach at 450 hours on the eastern flank of Dieppe. Unable to launch their assault to destroy the coastal battery, they instead took to sniping the German position in an effort to disrupt their operation, a tactic that seemingly worked as no Allied vessels were reported hit by it during the entire operation. By comparison, on the western flank, Number 4 Commando, along with 50 US Army Rangers, launched an almost flawless raid on Orange Beach and moved up towards the battery. Among Number 4 Commando's men was Major Patrick Porteous, who was shot at close range by a German soldier, the bullet passing through his hand and upper arm. Yet despite this, he charged at his assailant and killed him with his bayonet. When another senior officer was killed during the assault on the guns, Porteous rushed across open ground under fire to take command of his men and lead them in the assault. Shot a second time, he continued on undaunted, until finally, as the guns fell to the British, he collapsed from loss of blood, but would later be evacuated and receive the Victoria Cross for his actions, the British Commonwealth's highest award for gallantry. Landing on Green Beach, the South Saskatchewan Regiment landed in darkness and achieved some element of surprise against the Germans based at Pourville. But as they mustered, they discovered that some of their number had disembarked their landing craft on the wrong side of the river. Despite achieving their initial objectives, the goal was now to link up the two groups, but fire from the Germans perched on the cliffs on both sides of the landing beach caused carnage. The regiment's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Cecil Merritt, rose to the challenge, standing up and swinging his helmet. He told his men there was nothing to it and had them follow him across the only bridge. Merritt then led attacks up the hill with his troops, joined by part of the Cameron Highlanders, the unit's piper still blowing on his bagpipes. But despite them pushing some two kilometers inshore, they soon encountered very heavy resistance and had to withdraw back to the beach. Among those landing at Green Beach was an RAF flight sergeant named Jack Nissenthal. He, along with a small number of Canadian bodyguards, were tasked with capturing the new German radar station at Pourville and gathering intelligence on its capabilities. Having failed in that regard, Nissenthal instead took to cutting telephone wires linked to the radar station, forcing the German operators to resort to radio communication, which could then be intercepted by Allied intelligence across the English Channel, allowing them to ascertain the radar station's performance, just not in the way they had planned. Nissenthal had been selected for the mission given his expertise in Allied radar technology, but such was the fear that he may be captured and his knowledge extracted under torture, he was provided with a cyanide pill if he felt his position was hopeless. Failing that, his bodyguards had orders to shoot him. Meanwhile, at Blue Beach, the landing troops from the Royal Regiment of Canada, plus three platoons from the Black Watch of Canada and an artillery detachment got off to a terrible start. The landing was made around half an hour later than planned, by which time a smoke screen that had been laid by the RAF had dissipated, leaving them exposed to German fire from a pillbox located on top of a nearby cliff. In a scene reminiscent of troops going over the top in World War I, the beach turned into a mess of bodies, as Canadian troops were cut down mercilessly by German machine guns and mortar fire. A small number of them managed to make it off the beach and up the cliffs, but were kept in constant combat through the morning, unable to break out or withdraw. As the battle for the flanks of Dieppe got underway, 
the Royal Navy and Air Force began preparing the red and white beaches where the main force would be landing by bombarding known German positions. Hurricane fighter bombers bombed and strafed German forces up the cliffs to the east and those dug in near the beach before laying a smoke screen to conceal the approach of the landing craft. The plan had been to deploy the tanks immediately upon the start of the landing, but unfortunately the tank landing craft were delayed, meaning the infantry landed without their armoured support. The Germans reorganised as the British aircraft departed and opened up on the landing zones. Tens of men seemed to be falling to German machine gun fire at a time, many not even getting off their landing craft before being hit from German positions on the cliff and a former casino in the town that had been fortified and turned into a makeshift fortress. Those that did get off often found themselves clambering over the bodies of men they had come to know like brothers, but were now lifeless corpses. Sergeant John Legate later recalled, we just had to stay close to the wall. The crossfire coming in at us made it impossible to move two feet from the wall or you got it. There was nobody around to look after the wounded. There was no protection against the mortar bombs which were dropping all around us. It was impossible to give orders, to try and do anything, and it turned out to be every man for himself. Eventually, and to no doubt some relief of the Canadians who were pinned down behind the beach's seawall, the Churchill tanks of the 14th Canadian Army Regiment began to arrive, but by then, serious damage had already been done. Sadly, the arrival of the tanks did little to turn the tide in the Canadians' favour. 29 Churchill tanks were landed on the beaches, fewer than had been planned for, and of these, two sank in deep water, and a further 12 were immobilised when they became bogged down in the soft shingle of the beach. However, 15 tanks still managed to make it up and over the seawall, only to run into numerous obstacles the Germans placed in their path, which they couldn't traverse. Survivors from the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry also managed to cross the German defensive line into the town, but with the tanks unable to go any further, it would have been suicide to continue, and so they began a fighting withdrawal back to the beach. Pinned behind the seawall, Colonel Bob Labatt, commanding officer of the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, tried desperately to radio the 2nd Canadian Division's commander, Major General Roberts, to report the situation, but his radio was damaged, meaning the messages were garbled. Roberts instead believed that a breakout had taken place, and so deployed his reserves in the shape of the Montreal Fusiliers and British Royal Marines of A Commando. Hitting the beaches, they shared the same fate as the troops before them, many being killed having barely been able to put one foot on the beach. With nearly all the German forces in northwestern France being alerted to the news of the raid, there was now a scramble to rush reinforcements to Dieppe. Additionally, the Luftwaffe began scrambling aircraft to attack the beaches where they ran into heavy British fighter cover, while the German Navy also deployed high-speed e-boats in an attempt to torpedo the flotilla of ships, but RAF Hurricanes swooped down on these vessels, shooting them up before they could reach the coast of Dieppe. By 830 hours, realizing the day was lost, those still alive on Blue Beach began to surrender to the German defenders. Later in the morning at Portville, the Cameron Highlanders and the South Saskatchewan Regiment were soon engaged in a running fight back to Green Beach. However, it was obvious that any attempt to reach the landing craft once there would be tantamount to suicide. And so Lieutenant Colonel Merritt led a small force to hold off the Germans to allow as many of their comrades to escape as possible. Among those that made it off the beach was Flight Sergeant Niesenthal. Merritt would later be captured when he and his surviving men could fight no longer although for his actions, he would later receive the raid's second Victoria Cross. On the two main beaches, the Germans had, by late morning, started advancing on the Canadians, taking prisoners in droves as those still alive found themselves with little alternative but to surrender. Major Forbes West had been shot in the leg near the seawall and was left unable to move when he was captured. The Germans allowed the unhurt Canadians to gather up their wounded comrades, including West, in order to get them off the beaches and to receive medical attention as prisoners of war. But then the air growled with the sound of an RAF fighter bomber beginning its attack run. West recalled, There wasn't anything we could do to stop it. We couldn't say, Boys, it's all over and you're killing us, not the Germans. 
So the bombs came down, and then the Germans made all the people who had been helping pick up the wounded get off the beach. And then the tide came in, and unquestionably, some people who might have been picked up went out with the tide because they were too badly wounded to help themselves. As it became clear that the raid was turning into a bloodbath, there now became a frantic effort to evacuate as many of the men as possible. However, the landing craft that had carried them to the beaches had also been mauled by German defenses, including growing numbers of Luftwaffe aircraft filling the skies. RAF Fighter Command's plan to lure as many German planes in as possible had worked, but then backfired spectacularly as German fighters tore up the British, Canadian, and a handful of American squadrons. With only a few seaworthy landing craft remaining to escape on, any equipment that would take up space was discarded, including all of the Churchill tanks that made it ashore. Many of the landing craft were overloaded, damaged, and some even sinking slowly, but few of the soldiers cared. It was a way off the hell of the Dieppe beaches, even if that meant running the gauntlet of German mortars, machine guns, and aircraft. By 1400 hours, it was all over. Of the 10,500 Allied troops, sailors, and airmen deployed to participate in Operation Jubilee, over 4,000 had been killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. The Canadians alone losing two-thirds of their total force, with 907 dead and 1,946 captured. Much of the blame initially fell rather unfairly on the 2nd Canadian Division Commander, Major General Roberts, and he was never to command troops in the field again. In the air, the RAF lost 106 aircraft, while only downing around 48 Germans. Adding insult to injury was the fact that six of the lost RAF planes came down as a result of friendly fire, as mass confusion reigned, while three high-speed rescue boats based in Dover were also lost, attempting to pick up down flyers left bombing in the English Channel. The only saving grace taken from Dieppe by Fighter Command was that the new Mark IX Spitfire had proven it was, at least, a match for the FW-190. Although operating at the extreme of its range over Dieppe from bases in England meant that Spitfire pilots often had around 5 to 10 minutes of fuel for combat, limiting its effectiveness. In all, 33 landing craft deployed were total write-offs, while many others suffered various degrees of damage. Added to this was the loss of the Royal Navy destroyer HMS Berkeley, which was damaged by German aircraft and then scuttled while escorting the bruised and bloodied force back to Britain. Immediately after the raid concluded, there was an effort on both the part of Churchill and Mountbatten to put a spin on events that would portray them in a positive light. At first, the raid was declared a costly victory, but the public was not fooled, and so when the truth came out, both then considered the experience of Dieppe a necessary lesson before the great crusade against Nazi tyranny could begin with a full-blown Allied invasion of France from the sea. Churchill would rather coldly go on to say that so important were the lessons of Operation Jubilee that the raid was a Canadian contribution of the greatest significance to final victory. Mountbatten went even further, stating after the war that, I have no doubt that the Battle of Normandy was won on the beaches of Dieppe. For every man who died in Dieppe, at least 10 more must have been spared in Normandy in 1944. While it's true that Dieppe was heavily scrutinized during the planning for D-Day in order to not repeat the same mistakes, it is also clear that Mountbatten and his planning staff were already aware of many of Jubilee's shortcomings beforehand and instead decided to gloss over them by relying on the elements of surprise without having a backup plan. A typical example of this being the lack of heavy naval gun support from larger warships, the destroyer escort force having guns that were of much smaller caliber than the German shore batteries, and of little help against some of the stronger German fortifications. Other failings include a lack of updated intelligence regarding German preparedness between Rutter and Jubilee, and the lack of a pre-raid bombardment by heavy bombers, and any real investigation into how tanks would operate on Dieppe's beaches. While no one person can be blamed for all these shortcomings, Mountbatten remained an unpopular figure in Canada after the war for his role in the Dieppe raid. For Canadians, Dieppe holds a place in the public psyche akin to the Somme in Britain, Gallipoli in Australia, and Iwo Jima in the United States. 
It is a tale of how, in the end, after all the politics, ideology, and debates over necessity have passed, ultimately the story of war is nothing more than the story of humanity's ability to inflict suffering on others.